Um, as you know, uh, last, uh, last week, President Obama, actually two weeks ago now, uh, President Obama rolled out a new strategic guidance uh, on American defense for the 21st century. Uh, earlier this month, uh, we released this guidance uh, for the Department of Defense, and that's important. It was guidance to the Department of Defense, which recognizes the United States is now at a turning point uh, after a decade of war, including uh, the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. As the President and Secretary of uh, Defense, uh, Leon Panetta, said, the new guidance is designed to clarify our strategic interests in the world after 10 years of war and robust defense spending in a very challenging fiscal climate. It became apparent to us, uh, and during the review that was conducted by the President, that even without the mandated reductions in the defense budget, the United States would need to shift both our investments and the way in which the Department of Defense operates, particularly as we are facing growing challenges at both the high end and the low end of the spectrum of conflict. Uh, the world in which we now live and the emerging challenges we face call for us to strengthen existing alliances while developing new capabilities and regionally tailoring our posture to the current security environment. While key strategic choices must be made, our determination to protect core U.S. national security interests and critical international commitments uh, and relations remains absolute, and that includes, of course, our core international commitment and interest in Europe and Europe security. The U.S. military will remain capable across the spectrum, fully prepared to deter and defeat aggression and to defend the homeland uh, and our allies, including, of course, our three Baltic uh, allies uh, that, uh, that I'm happy to join today, and to operate effectively in coalitions. The military will shift its institutional weight and focus away from preparing for troop-intensive counterinsurgencies and stability operations towards capabilities needed to maintain presence, to project power, and to deter in coordination with allies and partners. The second major shift uh, is in recalibrating and rebalancing the size and the composition of U.S. ground, air, and naval forces. We will maintain our two war force sizing construct, which is critical to reassuring our allies and partners and to deterring potential adversaries. At the same time, the U.S. will take a fresh approach to this construct. Namely, we will not size U.S. forces to, over, to two overlapping large-scale ground intensive combat operations. Rather, if we are engaged in a major combat operation in one theater, we will focus on denying the objectives of or imposing unacceptable costs on an, opportuni an opportunistic aggressor somewhere else. This change will allow the U.S. military to reduce its overall size and take advantage of new concepts of operations allowed by advances in space, cyberspace, special operations, precision strike, and other capabilities. Let me emphasize uh, that Europe remains our partner of choice to address security challenges in Europe and across the globe. Consistent with NATO's new strategic concept, which was adopted just over a year ago in Lisbon, we will maintain the forces necessary to fulfill our Article 5 commitments and to strengthen allied and partner capabilities and forces necessary to address the security challenges of the 21st century. All of these points will help reinforce the two core messages where Europe, including the Baltic states, are concerned. Uh, from our defense strategy. We are absolutely committed to maintaining the capabilities we need for Article 5. And we are absolutely committed not just to maintaining, but to enhancing our ability to partner with Europeans on global security missions. And with that, let me uh, open up the floor. Uh, let's start in Vilnius uh, on questions. I'm sure you uh, have many in, on the basis of both uh, what I've said, but importantly what the President and the Secretary of Defense have already laid out. Thanks. If I may begin, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Vaidatos Benushis. I am from the Baltic News Service News Agency. 
speaking about military security, what Lithuanian uh, leaders stress is their worry and their concern about Russia strengthening uh, military uh, in Western regions, and especially in Kaliningrad uh, district. Is the United States sharing uh, the same concern, and what can be done to reflect that military buildup? Thank you. Uh, our uh, our uh, emphasis uh, in uh, in thinking about our de defense strategies takes a global look, of which Europe is a central and uh, essential uh, part. Uh, we are looking at risks, uh, not only in terms of capabilities, but also in terms of intentions. Uh, and uh, but that, in that regard, we, uh, we note uh, what is going on uh, in Russia, uh, but what is going on in Russia is complicated. It is not just uh, what is happening in the military sphere, it's also what is happening in the political sphere. Uh, we are committed, as I know uh, Lithuania is, to building a strong, enduring partnership with Russia. Uh, we are at the same time committed to making sure that everyone understands that the security of all NATO members uh, and that includes the Baltic states, is an absolute commitment of the United States and that we will maintain uh, the capabilities necessary to ensure that security. Uh, but we do live in a world in which the, uh, the, uh, the idea of a major military confrontation between NATO and Russia is, is no longer the guiding principle of how we think about uh, security. In fact, a guiding principle is to build a strategic partnership uh, with Russia bilaterally uh, in the case of all the individual NATO countries and also between NATO and Russia. At the same time, we will maintain the commitments and the capabilities to make sure that the security of every NATO member, and that includes the security of Lithuania and the other Baltic states, is guaranteed. Should we go to uh, Tallinn next? Hello, Evelyn Galdea from Estonian daily newspaper Postimes. Um, uh, my question is about the upcoming uh, summit in Chicago. Has it become already a bit clearer what topics might be the main things on the agenda and what might be the main messages from the summit? Uh, thanks for that question. Uh, yes, it is getting increasingly clearer what the topics for Chicago will be. We're going to focus on, on three areas of our activities. Uh, but before I, I, I look at those topics, let me put it in a broader context. Uh, we had a very important and very successful summit in Lisbon in November 2010, where we adopted a new strategic concept and a new sort of strategy for how to think about the alliance's uh, role in international, in international affairs uh, for the next decade. Uh, where, what we see in Chicago is not a new summit and a new statement, but the beginnings of the process of implementing that strategy. With regard, uh, therefore, to the three areas where we're looking at, uh, we're looking at Afghanistan, uh, uh, which remains our most important and our largest uh, military operation in the history of this alliance. We're going to look at capabilities and particularly how do we maintain the capabilities to defend ourselves at a time of, of uh, fiscal austerity, and we're going to look at partnerships and how we can make sure that working together with other countries, we can enhance security for all. Uh, specifically, with respect to Afghanistan, we will be looking at making sure that the transition process that we started in Lisbon is underway and continuing. Uh, we see progress uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan with Afghan security forces being increasingly capable and able of providing security for their own people. 50% uh, of the country uh, of the people in Afghanistan now live in areas in which the Afghan National Security Forces are in the lead for security uh, and are, have taken responsibility uh, for security in those areas. And we're looking to complete that process by the end of 2014 when all of Afghanistan will be uh, uh, the responsibility for the Afghan Security Forces. At the same time, uh, we're looking at how we can maintain our partnership in an enduring commitment to Afghanistan. Uh, what we're looking for is not to end our relationship with Afghanistan in 2014, but to extend it for the next decade and beyond in order to ensure that NATO and the individual countries, including the United States, has a strong, enduring relationship with Afghanistan. In terms of capabilities, what we're looking at is to find ways in which we can use the 
uh, few, the fewer defense dollars and euros and other currencies uh, that we have within the alliance to make them go further than they have in the past. And the key concept here is the concept of smart defense, that we spent not necessarily more, but we spent, spent more together. Uh, and the way to do that is to think about capabilities that maybe the alliance can acquire uh, uh, in which individual allies will only pay a part uh, but to get the capability as a whole for the alliance. We've had, for example, uh, AWACS aircraft, those are aircraft that provide airborne surveillance and warning. Uh, they are owned and operated by the alliance. They are used in Afghanistan and they were used in the Libya operation. We are also looking at acquiring for the alliance a uh, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance capability, big drones that are able to look at uh, a wide area for surveillance uh, of uh, and, and provide intelligence uh, to the alliance. And we have concepts like Baltic air policing, which we seek uh, to extend uh, beyond 2018 and indeed for the indefinite future, in which NATO takes on the task of providing uh, air policing off over the skies in the Baltic countries so that the Baltic countries, your countries, don't have to expend the resources uh, your limited resources on buying air, air forces that other allies already possess. And you can concentrate on, say, in Estonia, investing in cyber defense capabilities or in providing uh, expeditionary forces uh, for deployment in, uh, in, in, other, in other areas. So that's how we hope that we can strengthen the capabilities of the alliance, even as the number of resources available are less. And finally, uh, just a word on partnerships. Uh, just as the United States recognizes that we need partners to deal with uh, the challenges uh, around the world, uh, so NATO recognizes that it can only achieve its security if it finds partners uh, to work with. So in Afghanistan, uh, we have 22 other countries that participate in the NATO-led operation. Uh, in Libya, we had five countries that joined us in partnership uh, to, uh, to deal with uh, that, uh, uh, that situation. In the Gulf of Aden, we worked together with 19 other countries to provide uh, security for shipping against piracy. And in, each, and in this and other ways, we work with countries around the globe uh, to find ways to enhance their security uh, as well as our security and security within the region and internationally. And we're looking at ways to uh, make clear that we value not only partnerships in theory, but we value them in practice. So that's the, the, in, broad, in broad brushstrokes what the agenda in Chicago uh, will look like. Let's take a question next from Riga. Well, my name is Andrei Khatev. Uh, I'm uh, working for a newspaper Telegraph. My question is uh, how long uh, NATO is ready to maintain air patrolling over the Baltic countries? I guess it costs a lot. And is it possible that uh, this program may be closed? Uh, it's a very good question, and, and uh, as I started to say in my previous answer, we are working very hard uh, within this alliance, and it's not just the United States, it's all those countries that participate in air policing uh, uh, up to this point, uh, and, and indeed the three countries uh, that, uh, that we're talking to here, to make sure that Baltic air policing will not only be extended to 2018, but indeed beyond and for an indefinite period. Everyone in this alliance understands that it is impossible or not the right way to go for the Baltic countries to provide, to buy the, and procure the aircraft necessary to police their own skies. And it is far cheaper and far better uh, for the alliance to take on this mission. We do this not only for the Baltic states, we do it for Iceland. Uh, we do it because it is the way in which we can make our defense dollars go further and faster. Uh, so there is an absolute commitment on the United States' part, on the part of key allies, including Germany, uh, to make sure that we will continue uh, the air policing mission and to make sure that we can continue the air policing mission in a way uh, that uh, uh, is sustainable for the long run. In order to do that, we need to do two things. One, we need to get more allies to engage and be participate in these kinds of operations. Uh, these operations, this air policing operation, is not only a good way to provide security over the skies of the Baltic countries, it's also a way to enhance the interoperability of air forces and the training that is provided to pilots uh, who fly those air forces. And uh, as we saw in Libya, 
uh, we may be called upon to uh, engage in air combat or air operations on a moment's notice. And having interoperable and well-trained forces, which we can achieve through uh, Baltic air policing, is a net benefit to this alliance. Uh, at the same time, it's very clear that uh, Baltic air policing is something to which the Baltic countries need to continue to, co co to contribute. While you may not have airplanes uh, in the sky or pilots flying in airplanes, you do provide the air, uh, the air bases and you provide the host nation support that is necessary to make this mission sustainable. And uh, just as we will be looking at other countries to provide the air crews and the airplanes, we will be looking towards the Baltic states to continue to provide and to look at ways to, to enhance uh, the host nation's support provided uh, as your contribution to Baltic air policing, and that's how you should see it. You are contributing each and every day to Baltic air policing, not, be, not by having airplanes or, or pilots, but by having the infrastructure from which those airplanes fly. And we will continue to look to your countries to find ways in which to enhance uh, that contribution as well. We can move back to uh, Vilnius for another question. Vaidas Arjunas from Lithuanian Daily Newspaper, Lietuvos Rytas. Now, you, when you spoke about the shift, obviously in the major focus is now Asia. However, you said that uh, there will still be capable forces in Europe left. Does this mean you will still leave the tactical nuclear weapon, U.S. tactical nu uh, nuclear weapon in Europe? Uh, and does it mean that if you still leave the capable forces, you see any potential risks in Europe or in the region? Uh, let me first just uh, spend one minute talking about this shift. It's important to understand what this shift really is. It's not a shift from Europe to Asia. It is a shift from a uh, preoccupation of a decade of war uh, where we had large numbers of forces in Iraq and Afghanistan to a recommitment and indeed a reinvestment in Asia while maintaining our commitment to the Middle East and of course to, uh, to Europe and other parts of the world. Um, it, it isn't the case that we haven't been focused on Asia. The United States is an Asian power. It's an Asian Pacific power, and it has been that from the days uh, of, the, of the Confederacy. And it will continue to be that uh, for, for the future. What we are doing is making sure that our investment in Asia, uh, which was drawn down during the decade of war, can be uh, maintained and indeed strengthened. But we're not doing that at the expense of any other commitment that we have. Uh, with respect to our commitment to Europe, that commitment is unchanged. It is the same commitment that we have had for the last uh, 65, uh, 63 years. It is enshrined in the North Atlantic Treaty uh, that was signed in 1949 uh, and amended as new nations became a part. And in 2004, the United States took upon itself, together with its other allies in NATO, to provide security uh, for uh, its new members, including the three Baltic states. We are committed and continue to be committed uh, to that fundamental uh, guarantee, including a guarantee uh, that an attack against any one of us is an attack against all, and we will respond accordingly. And we will maintain the capabilities necessary <laughs> to fulfill that commitment. With respect to nuclear weapons, um, we, uh, there is no plan uh, to change the current disposition of our nuclear force posture. Uh, we are interested in uh, enhancing transparency, uh, and we are interested in uh, finding ways to reduce uh, the uh, Russian advantage uh, of tactical nuclear weapons that exists. But our commitment uh, includes the continued stationing uh, of nuclear weapons in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in NATO. Uh, the same is with respect to the question of risks. Uh, we believe we have a force posture in Europe, and we will maintain a force posture in Europe that addresses the security risks that are out there, that we have sufficient capability, sufficient flexibility, not only to meet our own commitments, but to work together with our allies so we can meet our commitments together. And indeed, we're looking at ways of enhancing the ability to work with our allies because, as I said, Europe remains an, uh, our partner of choice to deal with threats and security risks in Europe 
and beyond Europe. And we're trying to find ways in which we can enhance the capacity of our forces to partner and cooperate in that manner. But let me just repeat one more time. This strategy is not designed in any way to reduce or change or alter our commitment to Europe. It is fundamentally about making sure that that commitment remains as strong and absolute as it was before, that we have the forces and the modern capabilities necessary to make that commitment, while at the same time recognizing that we have the capability to work together with our partners and allies in order to meet the security challenges that exist within Europe and across the globe. Let's go back to Talan now. Hi, my name is Tarmo Weiberg. I'm from the Estonian Broadcasting Company. I know it's not specifically on NATO, but do you see that probably U.S. soldiers will be in Afghanistan after 2014? Do you see that these soldiers will need any protective laws like was in case in Iraq? And do you think that's the case? I think we are committed to Afghanistan and to have a security and partnership relationship with Afghanistan, we as the United States, for the long term. And that commitment can include the continued deployment of American troops to advise and assist Afghan security forces. This is an issue that we will be discussing in Chicago. We have never said that the combat troops or the troops will leave by the end of 2014 and there will be no more troops in 2015. We have always been open to the possibility of maintaining those troops. How those troops are maintained, under what kind of situation, is something that we are looking to negotiate with both Afghanistan directly in a negotiation that is currently ongoing and with our NATO partners. Because not only would we like the United States to remain, we would like NATO to remain in Afghanistan for the longer term to have an enduring partnership. With respect to the legal issues, the United States in every country in which it deploys its military forces has legal arrangements, whether status of forces agreements or other legal arrangements, to provide for the protection of privileges and immunities of those forces. And we will only maintain forces in those countries in which the privileges and immunities and legal guarantees for our forces are secured. No reason to believe that we won't be able to have those legal immunities and privileges maintained in Afghanistan. And indeed, we have them today. And if there is an agreement with Afghanistan to maintain our forces, we will have them tomorrow. Let's go back to Riga for another question. Russia is about to place its Iskander missiles in the Kaliningrad region. Does NATO plan to respond to that? Well, I think it's important to read very carefully what President Medvedev said on November 23rd with respect to the deployment of offensive missiles. First, we do not accept the Russian idea that it needs to respond to our deployment of defensive missile systems that are not directed against Russia, nor are able or aimed at undermining its strategic deterrence. That the appropriate response to that is to deploy offensive systems. We do not accept that. We think that is a wrong move on their part. At the same time, President Medvedev said very clearly that what he was seeking was an agreement with the United States and with NATO to enhance missile defense cooperation between his country and our countries. We, as NATO, are fully and completely committed to finding ways to enhance missile defense cooperation with Russia. That was part of our decision in Lisbon when we decided to deploy missile defense systems directed against and designed against the threats from southeastern, from to southeastern Europe and the rest of Europe coming from the Middle East. 
uh, and that remains our commitment today. Uh, President Obama and President Medvedev reiterated that commitment when they met in Honolulu in November, uh, and we continue to look towards ways of uh, bridging the differences we have on missile defense cooperation through negotiations, both uh, between NATO and Russia and between the United States and Russia. And as President Medvedev made very clear, it was only if those negotiations failed, it was only if we were not able to achieve a, uh, an agreement on missile defense cooperation that Russia might decide to take steps, uh, including the possible deployment of missiles in Kaliningrad, uh, in response. So before we start thinking about what do we do if, let's talk about how we can make sure that the if doesn't happen. Uh, hello, my name is Bernardas Gailus. I am from uh, Lithuanian National Television. And uh, I have one question. You mentioned uh, the strategic partnership with Russia, but uh, we all know that anti-NATOism, so to say, or even especially anti-Americanism, is very strong among the uh, Russian political elite. Uh, and we also know that uh, Russia openly speaks about uh, NATO as uh, an enemy, as a threat. So uh, do you think that um, uh, to talk about strategic partnership is realistic uh, in these circumstances? We have, of course, there are many opinions of many countries, uh, of many people in many countries. Uh, and uh, uh, what we as government uh, officials need to do is to work together with, the, uh, with our counterparts in, in, uh, in Russia and other countries. I will refer you back to uh, our meeting in Lisbon, in which President Medvedev uh, and the presidents of our, uh, of our 28 allied countries came together in the, uh, the NATO-Russia Council uh, summit meeting and committed uh, to working together to build a strategic partnership. That is what NATO is committed to doing. That is what every member of NATO is committed to doing. Uh, and we are seeking ways to, to move that forward. And we have made significant advances uh, in terms of our, uh, of our partnership. Uh, Russia is a uh, vitally important partner in our effort in Afghanistan, not only by helping to train counter-narcotic operations, but most importantly, by providing uh, the rail links and the airspace through which we resupply and supply our forces. Uh, the United States has flown 1,700 aircraft and transported 225,000 troops into Afghanistan and out of Afghanistan over Russian airspace. It's that kind of cooperation that we seek uh, from Russia in order to, to uh, as part of our partnership. Uh, we are partnering in building uh, the capability to counter terrorism. And indeed, our, uh, our work together on this between NATO and Russia is intense, uh, it is focused, and it is helping both of us to deal with not only the threat of, but the consequences of terrorist attack. Uh, we are working together in uh, the Gulf of Aden, where uh, we are trying to protect our shipping uh, from piracy. And our ships, uh, US ships and NATO ships and Russian ships are in constant communication uh, to work together to deal with the scourge of piracy. So in these ways, we are trying to enhance uh, our um, uh, our relationship uh, to build a partnership that is indeed strategic, uh, that has consequences that enhance the capability uh, and security, not only of NATO, but also of Russia, and indeed by doing so together. And in, as I said, in the missile defense area, we believe that cooperating on missile defense is one other way in which we can enhance the security, not only of Russia, but of NATO. Uh, and we are committed to trying to make that work. Uh, ultimately, whether we will succeed depends uh, on the degree to which uh, both sides in the partnership are willing to invest in it. Uh, we would argue that in the last three years, we have invested a great deal, uh, as, and so has Russia, uh, and we have made great strides. At the same time, we have our differences, and those differences will remain. We have a fundamental difference on Georgia, where we do not accept uh, that Russia can continue the occupation of Georgian territory. And we insist that it implements and fully complies with the 2008 uh, agreements. Uh, we have a difference uh, right now over missile defense. And we are not going to stop deploying our missile defense capability uh, just because Russia uh, doesn't agree with it. 
We are committed to finding a way to cooperate, but if we can't, we will still deploy missile defenses. Uh, but it is through dialogue and, uh, and uh, cooperation that we seek to extend the relationship between NATO and Russia rather than through confrontation or fear or, uh, or, uh, or, or any other way. Let's go back to uh, Tallinn for another question. Okay, I'd last, like to ask about the uh, embarrassing video posted uh, to YouTube next, uh, last week. Have you received any information of um, unrest after that? I know that re the first response was relatively calm in Afghanistan as well. Have you received any information about the increased level of threat to coalition troops there because of that? And uh, what's the latest update on the investigation? Um, uh, I was actually in Afghanistan uh, uh, when the video uh, first emerged. and. Uh, I think the reaction uh, throughout Afghanistan was uh, the same as the reaction everywhere else. Uh, people uh, deplored uh, the behavior uh, of, uh, of the Marines. Uh, this was an act uh, that is uh, frankly inhuman uh, and is completely and totally unacceptable. Uh, we immediately started an investigation uh, of, uh, of the incident, uh, not only particularly focused on the individuals that were depicted in the video, uh, but also in the command uh, arrangements that, uh, that uh, were part of this. And we are in the middle of that investigation. Uh, we have, uh, um, uh, and we're pursuing that uh, to the fullest possible extent. But there can be no doubt that the United States military and NATO military uh, 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 condemn and deplore this kind of behavior. Uh, that we do not believe that this is the right way uh, to treat anyone. Uh, we, uh, we, find, we will find, uh, um, we, will, we will do everything possible to make sure that our soldiers respect uh, 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 people of, uh, of any kind. Uh, they respect uh, that in a way that is, uh, that is human. Uh, I think the reaction, the quick reaction of the United States, uh, the fact that Secretary Panetta had a very good conversation with President Karzai about this issue, to make clear that we were investigating it, that we did deplore it, uh, did leave, uh, lead to uh, a, a relative calm uh, throughout Afghanistan uh, as a result uh, of this. We did not see and we are not seeing any increase in threats or increase in security challenges or, or circumstances to our troops, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, and I think it is, reflects the fact that Afghans understand as much as anybody else that we don't uh, condemn that we don't uh, accept this kind of behavior and we will do whatever we can to make sure it never happens again. And then we'll go back to Riga once more. Uh, you are talking about new uh, U.S. defense strategy, uh, but does it mean that NATO uh, may reconsider or change uh, the plan for defense of the Baltic countries? Uh, I can be very brief on that and say no. Uh, because the new defense strategy will not change in any way America's ability to fulfill all its commitments to NATO. Uh, and as a result, the strategies that we have for defending NATO are going to be unaffected by the change in American defense strategy. And that includes our strategies for defending the Baltic states. And we have uh, time for one more question. I think we'll make the final question. We'll go back to Vilnius. Uh, talking about bridging the differences uh, between you and Russia, uh, exactly when do you think those differences would become a security issue, security problem? Uh, when, where is the red line Russians would cross? Would the deployment of any capabilities in the Western regions that Lithuanian president, for instance, has already said about that? Where would that, where, where would this red line would be, in your opinion? Well, rather than talking about red lines, uh, we think it makes more sense for not only us, but you and every other, every other country in, uh, in NATO to try to find ways to bridge differences. Uh, we, do, we live in an era in which bridging differences through the use of force uh, doesn't tend to be very effective. And bridging differences through dialogue and cooperation is more effective. We have achieved through the reset uh, a, uh, a significant amount of improved
cooperation with Russia on the issues that I mentioned before, including on the issue of, which I haven't mentioned, on Iran, which is important given the threat that Iran poses. So we are committed to this dialogue. We're committed to finding ways to cooperate in order to deal with the threats that threaten us both, not only the United States and Lithuania, but also Russia, and to find ways to cooperate in dealing with those threats. There can be no doubt, and there is no doubt, in Moscow or any other place, that when it comes to the defense of NATO territory, when it comes to the defense of NATO interests, the United States and the alliance are fully and completely committed to making sure that that defense and security is maintained. There is no doubt about this in Russia. No one has any doubt about it, nor should they, and there's no reason to doubt it. But our relationship cannot just exist on the notion that what we're committed to is to providing the security of our territory and interests through the defense capabilities. It must also be based on building security relationships that enhance the security not only of all NATO countries, but of Russia as well. It is in that way that we're going to find that our security will ultimately be safeguarded, and not just by having the right military capabilities. That's important. The United States remains committed to that commitment. It remains committed to having the forces necessary to maintain its Article V commitment, but at the same time, it is equally important that we engage with countries like Russia and indeed other partners in order to enhance the security of us all. With that, thanks very much for your interest. Enjoyed this. Hope we can do it sometime again, perhaps before Chicago or after. And I wish you a great day in the Baltic states. It's nice and sunny, but very cold here too. Thank you. Thank you.